Well, good morning. Good morning. It is wonderful to be here. Oh, there we go. All right. If you will please stand as we begin our time, third Sunday of Advent, we celebrate the joy candle. This is one of my, I say this about a lot of songs, I got a lot of favorite songs, Once in Royal David City. It's a Christmas hymn. It was actually written as a uh, children's uh, poem, in a sense, contrasting the height of the Christmas story, the truth of Emmanuel, God with us, uh, with the earthiness of of God with us in a manger. Um, So royal David's city with the lowliness of a cattle shed, Uh, the the glory of heaven uh, to the poverty of earth. The third stanza describes, and it's, you know, maybe speculative, the silent years, how Jesus was a, a pattern for the little children. And then the fourth verse, the promise that recorded in John 14, 3, If I go before you, Jesus says, and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am, once in Royal David's city. Well, good morning and welcome to Crossgate. We're so glad to have all of you uh, here with us this morning and uh, especially to have uh, so many visitors uh, here with us. And uh, what a great uh, weekend we've been, we've been having already. Uh, for some of you who may not know, we've been having a uh, retirement uh, celebration last night uh, for, uh, for Tom Musselman as he's uh, finishing up 24 years of ministry uh, here. 
and uh, Joy, who stood by his, uh, his side the whole time and has served and loved on uh, this congregation, this community uh, so well. And it was a uh, fabulous night of uh, celebration, and uh, there's the things of that that we're still bringing into this service, though our attention is focused on God, uh, but just a thankfulness for God's servant and how he has, uh, has worked through them uh, so much. I do want to say in a special uh, thank you uh, to so many of you who helped out to make, uh, make that night last night what it was. There's so much uh, work and labor and labors of love and of care uh, that went into that. Uh, and it was just a huge encouragement, I know, to the Muslims um, and, uh, and to their family, but really to all of this congregation as well. We, uh, we appreciate, uh, appreciate all of you. Uh, we're just so thankful for how God has worked and how God uh, continues to work. Uh, and then we want to, to look to him this morning. As far as a lot of the normal announcements, I'm just going to direct you uh, to your bulletin and to some of the things that are in the foyer uh, to keep track of those uh, and to keep our focus on the, on the Lord this morning. But we do have uh, one further uh, message, a little bit of a, a surprise and a thank you um, from, uh, from the other side of the world. So we've got a video uh, they're going to pull up from some uh, close to Crossgate from uh, Tony and Kendall uh, Lorenzi. Uh, so we'll see if we can get that uh, pulled up now. Hey there, Tom and Joy. Hi, Tom. Hi, Joy. Don't forget about us here in Thailand. Yeah. <laughs> so we wanted to thank you guys uh, for being so welcoming. Mm -hmm. As you well know, I came to the church by myself the first time. Yeah. Tom greeted me at the front door, was super nice, put me at ease, and uh, later on invited me to the SALT training. Right. And uh, took me from, you know, level one Christian all the way up to where, hey, now we're missionaries here in Thailand. Exactly, and, and Tom and Joy, you both equipped me to, to be able to move to a foreign country do, doing mission work, doing God's work. Yes, and we have come such a long way. You all have brought us so far. Now we're over here and we're still growing. Yes. And uh, we just want to thank you for all that you've yeah. done in our lives. And don't think just because you're retiring that we're done with you. I'm going to drive you nuts. I'm going to be calling you a lot. So you're not Watch getting out. away. Not at all. So anyway, thank you for all you've done. Now we live in a third world country in a <laughs> container home. So Con thank you very much. Congratulations on your retirement. It's much deserved. We love you both and we wish you nothing but the best. And we look forward to talking to you soon. And as we say here in Thailand, Kap Kung Kra. Tom and Joy, God has had such an impact uh, through you on so many. Uh, we're thankful for, uh, for you folks around the other side of the world then, uh, sent from here, uh, some who've come from other states uh, up and, and traveling back and our reunions that are part of it, uh, and uh, as well as we think to, to the future of how God continues uh, to use y'all and uh, your grandkids behind you and, uh, and all of that. So we are uh, just, just so thankful. Uh, I do want to mention one of our, our special guests uh, this morning that y'all, many of y'all know very well, but Don and Barbara uh, Nielsen are back with us uh, this this morning, uh, back from Florida to come up for, for this occasion, and uh, uh, Don, who is, I think, even this past week in men's Bible study, men, we're talking about your uh, Sunday school class on Revelation, and he's, uh, he's taught so many times uh, here, and I'm uh, thankful to have him come and, uh, and bring in the Word uh, this morning. Uh, but as we, uh, as we come this morning, we are here uh, to worship our God, uh, and we come with that spirit of, of rejoicing. Uh, and in Advent, remembering uh, this time of how God has come to us and longing uh, for his return. Uh, but the joy of God's love uh, poured out to us, the promises that he's made to, to us, uh, the forgiveness of sins, uh, the way that we can come as sinners, uh, join together here, uh, because our God calls us into, into his presence uh, to rejoice in his love. Uh, so here the call to worship uh, this morning, both from Isaiah 52 and Luke 2. It says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. And then Luke 2, at that announcement of the birth, the angel said to them, I fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Would you pray with me as we come to worship? 
Lord our God, we do uh, come to you with great joy, uh, for Christ our Savior is the Lord, and you have uh, come to us uh, to work this marvelous way of salvation. Lord, who could have imagined it? Uh, who could have predicted it? Who could think that God would come in the place of man uh, for sinners and rebels like us who have turned uh, time and time again away from you uh, to trying to make everything be for ourselves, uh, trying to turn our face away from you and have our own way. And yet, Lord, that you have made a way of forgiveness. Uh, you have opened up a new and living way into your very throne room. And so this morning, uh, we gather and we come before Christ's throne. We come before your heavenly throne together with all the saints because you are worthy of worship, uh, because you have rescued us, because that new and living way through Christ's blood continues uh, to be open for sinners. But Lord, meet with us by the power of your spirit and give us great joy in your salvation. But Lord, let our, our singing and our hearing and our serving and fellowshipping together be the overflow of hearts as you have poured out your love into us. And we thank you for your grace, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do please stand. Let us sing for joy.
We're going to do the prayer time uh, this morning a little bit uh, differently. I'm going to ask Tom and Joy uh, to come up um, this morning. And usually you have uh, Tom or one of the pastors uh, just taking this time to pray as a representative for the congregation and praying for our needs and bringing those uh, to the Father. And one of our needs also this morning is caring uh, for y'all. But this morning what we're going to do is have uh, some of the session and some of the ladies from the women's ministry that we've talked to. If y'all will come on, come on up, uh, just as representatives of the church are going to come and, and pray uh, for Tom and Joy. Y'all come right over into the, into the middle here. Um, uh, because we are so thankful for you and we want to give thanks uh, to you. Y'all come on up. Make a little more room. And I know if I asked and said, well, who wants to come up, that it would be the whole congregation right here. Uh, so we said we'd have a session and some of the ladies from the women's ministry uh, come just to uh, give thanks to God uh, for them and to ask for God's blessing on them. And not that Tom's ministry here is done yet, um, and uh, he's still going to be preaching on December 26th and, and still caring for all of y'all, and, and the relationships will continue. But, uh, but we want to, before God, give, give thanks. Let's go to the Lord together and... Uh, Go to the, to the Lord together in prayer. Would you pray with us? Our Father, 25 years ago or so, you laid it on the heart of, of Tom and Joy to, to come to Oconee County, to come up here to the upstate of South Carolina to plant a church, a church where Christ would be glorified and exalted, a church where the cross would be preached regularly, consistently, faithfully, a place where the, the good historic doctrines of the faith would be taught and a place where true disciples might be grown. And we thank you, Lord, that this morning... We can stand and, and thank you and that Crossgate Church is here, even after 25 years, and that we are still about the business of doing, fulfilling that calling. And so we don't say that, Lord, to, to glorify Tom and Joy, certainly not to glorify Crossgate Church, but to give you glory and to give you thanks for accomplishing that among us, for being here and for blessing uh, those efforts over these last two decades. And Lord, now Tom and Joy are about to venture out into the next chapter of their lives, and we just want to pray that you will continue to bless them, that you'll continue to use them, that you will show them the, the work that you've got for them there, uh, that you'll give them wonderful times with their family, their children and grandchildren but also that you will give them the opportunity to minister to others the way they've ministered to us. And again, we are just so thankful. But Father, we also pray for Crossgate. Uh, may we continue the work that's been started. May it not falter in the slightest. May we keep our focus. May we continue to do the work that you uh, have set for us to do. And we will give you the praise and the glory in all of this and in all things, for Jesus' sake. Father, thank you for this wonderful, gentle, and loving woman. Thank you for joy. Thank you that we, see, we have seen Jesus in her life for many years. And I thank you for the many people who have been touched to know you better because of her. And I know this is not the end of the ministry that you have for them. They have children, they have grandchildren, and many more that they haven't even met yet who will be influenced by your love through her. I'm asking you to equip her in soul and spirit and body and in mind be strengthened for this move and to do the tasks at hand, we ask that you just continually fill her to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. We 
that your love and your grace might be seen in every area of her life to every person she meets. Thank you, Father, for her life, her love, and your grace. Thank you for teaching us about you through joy. And gracious and glorious Father, we praise you for your goodness and for your glory. To think that you created us in your image for your glory. And that we are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works prepared in advance for us to do. And Father, we thank you for the good gifts and good works that you have done and will continue to do through Tanya. Have seen their love, their companionship, see their faith and love that springs from the hope that is stored up in heaven. Father, as they continue on, as they keep their eyes on you and walk with you in all of your ways, may those good works continue that you might be glorified, that they would bear much fruit for your kingdom and for your glory alone. Father God, we rejoice and give thanks this morning for the love, grace, and mercy that you have shed upon us at Crossgate through the ministry of Tanya Joy. We pray, Father, well, we thank you for, the, for what you've done in the past, but we look forward to what you're going to do in the future, both in the lives of Tanya Joy and in the life of Crossgate. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All God's people. I think appropriately we sing now, God rest, you merry gentlemen and women. Um, it is bittersweet to say goodbye in a sense or to say farewell, um, but we know the God whom holds you and us. So if we'll please stand as we continue, God rest, you merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember, Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day.
to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place, and with true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace, this holy tie of Christmas, all others don't deface, oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, I wired. There we go. All right. Greetings from from Florida. We're happy to be here to celebrate with you this great moment. Tom and Joy have meant so much to us, to Barbara and I, and we rejoice that we're able to participate in some small way with this this time. We're going to speak to you about a serious event that took place many years ago. The setting is in Ephesus. It's Paul's journey, having served faithfully the church at Corinth. He is now making his way to the east. He is taking a large sum of money with him. What's the sum of money? It's for the poor Jewish saints back in Jerusalem. And uh, it's a significant moment because uh, Gentiles are rather new to this thing called Christianity. And uh, the Jews back in Jerusalem were wondering about this expansion to these Christian, uh, these Gentile nations. And so they are um, a little skeptical, I think, about all the Pauline mission. And what Paul wants to do is he wants to bring back a trophy of God's grace, showing the expanse of the gospel among pure Gentiles, non-Jews. This is unusual. And he wants to show that uh, this gospel is not just for the Jews, but it's for all peoples across the world. And so in 57 AD, he's left Corinth, made his way up through Macedonia, crossed the Bosporus there. He's coming he's into Asia. He's coming down toward Ephesus. He doesn't want to spend the, any extra time. He's, he's fighting the uh, time frame, the calendar. He wants to get to Jerusalem. Um, in time for the Feast of Weeks. And uh, he wants to get there as quickly as possible. He knows if he stops at Ephesus, you know what's going to happen. He's going to meet lots of wonderful friends that he spent more than three years in the city of Ephesus teaching. And he knows that his trip is going to be delayed if he does that. So he circumvents Ephesus and he lands by ship at a place called Miletus, uh, about uh, three days' journey south of Ephesus. He's on his way to bring this monetary gift. It's a huge amount of gift from all of the Gentile churches. He wants to bring it to Jerusalem and show the Jerusalem Jewish Christians that the Gentiles are truly part of the people of God. And so he wants to do that. The stakes are high. The wolves are on the hunt for unwary sheep. False teaching looms. The people need to be reinforced through instruction and the teaching of the scriptures. 
And I would say that our situation today is not all that different. Today, our culture's howling voices are no less dangerous than they were in the first century. Demands made upon the Christian ministry today are heavy. Paul's address outlines what is needful based on his own experience in ministry, and in doing so, he outlines what a faithful ministry should look like. So we're going to look at chapter 20 now, and we're going to look at the, uh, the first 18 to 27 verses there. If you have your Bibles, if you turn there, we'll follow along. That would be helpful. Um, this is Paul's example. Paul gives us an example in those verses 18 to 27, and then verses 28 to 35, he gives a, ch a challenge to the church uh, at, at, in Ephesus, the Ephesian elders. So if you'll turn there, please note verses 18 and 19. The first example Paul gives here is that of an obedient servant. He's addressing the elders of the Ephesian church. They've come 30 miles uh, to take in this exposition from Paul. He addresses them and he says, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set, in foot in, set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. Did you notice that he said he's serving the Lord? Serving the Lord, uh, that means often a word serving there uh, means to slave. He slaves for the Lord. Paul never forgot whose servant he was. First and foremost, he was Christ's servant. He gave up his life to the Lord who purchased him on that sandy road to Damascus years ago, and his goal and everything he did was to serve the Lord who bought him. Serving the Lord could have been a motto of his. Well, serving the Lord was also his way of serving the Ephesians. So um, he views them as the Lord's people, and uh, his phrase there, um, he, uh, he, he did so with unswerving energy and devotion. He served with humility, Notice what the text says in verse 19. He served with humility, he served with tears, and he served with trials. Humility. Paul knows he's not his own. He is wholly at the service of another. His Lord made him a servant to the Lord's people. A little phrase there, you know, reflects that the elders had observed his behavior. Humility is the opposite of pride, and pride is a great danger for those in leadership positions. The temptation is there when people say, oh, that was a wonderful message, or I was greatly blessed by that. Well, George Whitfield in the colonial period of our land, handled pride in a rather unique way. You remember George Whitfield, he went up and down the East Coast preaching the gospel in those colonial years of our country. Uh, when he would get praise like, oh, um, Mr. Whitfield, I was so blessed by that message. Whitfield would handle pride in a very in unique way. He would say, um, I, when he would step down from the pulpit, he'd say, I know it. And the devil told me that just as I was stepping down from the pulpit. <laughs> Tom, you've shown yourself rem remarkably free from the pride that afflicts so many of us, especially those of us that have leadership positions in Christ's church. Um, uh, some, let me tell you a story about Tom. Uh, we um, had... Um, Blue Ridge come through our area cutting down trees, you know, under the power line. And they just left those trees strewn, you know. They would cut them up into about nine foot, eight foot, five foot lengths, you know, but just left them laying there. And it looked worse than Seneca did after that tornado that came through, you know. And um, I must have been 
standing in the back of the foyer there, and I was talking with some of these folks, and uh, Tom was there. And I happened to mention this mess in my yard, in the side yard, that needed to be cleaned up. Well, I didn't give much more thought than that. Well, Monday morning came around, and, uh, and uh, I was eating breakfast there, and the doorbell rang, and uh, I went to the door, and here's this fellow, this stranger, standing there in uh, work boots and uh, khaki pants, stained, uh, a sh floppy shirt, and a, the most gross-looking baseball cap I'd ever seen. It was Pastor Tom. <laughs> and he had a rake in one hand and a chainsaw in the other, and he was there to help me cut up these logs and stack them. And he spent a half a day with this fellow standing up here, cutting logs and stacking, helping a fellow get his ox out of a ditch. And we so appreciated that, Tom. So kind, so kind. That's just one of many, many stories I could tell you. Well, Paul served with whole soul love. He did so with tears, the text says. Uh, if you look at verse 31, tears is mentioned again. His ministry was not mechanical, was not with a cold professional disinterest. It embraced the wellsprings of his very being. His concern was not with himself, it was, was with the sheep that God had given him. The tears that's mentioned here uh, uh, indicates the intensity of the emotional level that he pursued his task. Tears. Tears of love. Tears of concern. Tears of commitment. This was no mechanical ministry. Nor was yours, Pastor Tom. I remember how impressed I was at hearing how you involved yourself with those in need, not only with believers in our congregation, but also with unbelievers in our community. Uh, you shared this with us at prayer meetings, and you served us and your community with whole-souled love. Paul served at great sacrifice to himself. He served with trials. He served through plots of the Jews trying to take his life. He had testified and debated with the Ephesian elders in their synagogue for three months. If you look at chapter 19 of the book of Acts, that's detailed for you. They soon made it plain, these Jews, that they had no sympathy with this obnoxious apostle. Stubborn unbelief led to their speaking evil of the gospel. They pursued Paul in Damascus. They pursued Paul in Antioch, Pisidia. They pursued Paul in Thessalonica, Corinth. And now, shortly when he arrives in Jerusalem, you'll see them pursuing him again. He withdraw, withdrew, taking with him his disciples. Um, he entered the hall of Tyrannus and reasoned for the hear with the hearers there for nearly two years every day. I don't know what he said every day for two years, but I'd like to have been there to hear the exposition of the Apostle Paul. Um, you know, uh, he bore all of his sufferings, and they were many, the Jews launched multiple plots against him. He bore these like a good soldier. He was an obedient servant. Paul followed his, in his Lord's footsteps. Luther once said, and I think interestingly, he said, prayer, meditation, and trials makes a theologian. Um, I think that uh, that was certainly the case in Paul's situation. But Pastor Tom, you too have reflected these virtues in your ministry. Humil humility, sometimes tears, and trials of one sort or another. The ministry always seems to bring its share of tears and trials, I've discovered. Thank you, brother, 
for your faithfulness to us. You are an obedient servant of the Lord, and we owe you dearly. Well, Paul was also a faithful teacher. If you look at chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, the text there says, You know how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Profitable instruction. Did you see that? Anything that was profitable. Paul did not shrink from difficult subjects. What was profitable was that his hearers might be saved. The gospel is a blunt package of raw truth. Yes, rebellious, lost sinners separated from a holy God. Yes, but it's wrapped. It's wrapped in an exquisite cord of love, the offer of forgiveness, the offer of acceptance, and eternal life. The declaration of such truths was not always congenial work, but Paul did not shrink from the task to tell people that they were dead in their trespasses and sins was not always received positively. But the outcome of such truths was often the embrace, folks, of eternal life. Thank you, Pastor Tom, for your ministry to us of what was profitable for our well-being as Christians. You, too, gave us profitable instruction. Now, Paul did this in a variety of locations. He did it in public, and he did it from house to house. You see the text? He taught publicly, yes. He was in the synagogue first, and then he went to the hall of Tyrannus for a period of two years. He also taught privately. He went house to house with the words of eternal life. Pastor Tom, you too have been fearless and faithful in presenting these hard but needful truths Sunday after Sunday in our congregation, every day during the week with people we don't even know, but we heard about. In prayer meetings, we thank you for your ministry. And Paul also was all embracive of persons. He went to both Jews and Greeks. And you know that uh, Jews and Greeks <laughs> didn't get along terribly well. But Paul reached out to both the Jews and the Greeks. The world of his day was comprised of Jews and Greeks. To such a populace, Paul taught without discrimination or prejudice. Greeks is Paul's word for Gentiles generally. It means non-Jews. It means the nations. I am thankful that under Tom and the elders' leadership in this church, racial discrimination is unknown. The gospel is presented to any and all alike. All are welcome here. And then there's the total gospel that Paul taught. Did you see the reference to repentance and faith in the text? And what Paul proclaimed and taught was a total turning away from sin. That is, repentance. And a turning toward God and the Lord Jesus. That is, faith and trust for salvation. This is pointed preaching. It's not general with little reference to sin or so indirect that no one could be offended. For to feel the need of a Savior requires a sense of offense and a turning from sin. Thank you, Pastor Tom, for a career of faithful preaching to us. You were never ashamed of the stark truths of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And then look at verses 22 to 24, if you would. Those verses have to do with a spent life. A spent life. And now, behold, says Paul, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account 
my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Bound by the Spirit, verse 22. Constrained by the Spirit. Paul already had misgivings about his faith in Jerusalem and Judea. If you, he'd written a letter to the Romans before leaving Corinth telling them that his plan was to go west. After he delivered this monetary gift to the poor saints in Jerusalem, his plan was to go west, to go to Rome, and use Rome as a jumping-off place for additional work in Spain. He wanted to go to Spain and plant churches there. Well, he is uh, aware that things may not go as planned because he says to the Romans in that letter, pray that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. His plan is to see Rome and Spain, but only after he delivers this huge monetary gift to the poor saints at Jerusalem. His fate is unknown. He says he's not knowing what is going to happen to me. But the Holy Spirit discloses that imprisonment lies ahead. That much he learns. The full nature of it remains obscure. And this is confirmed also as he made his way toward Jerusalem as the New Testament prophets accounted him on the way and they testified to him as he passed through city after city that imprisonment awaits you. Imprisonment awaits you. But Paul was unmoved by these concerns. Self-preservation was not something that he worried about. His prayer, may only Jesus Christ be magnified. And so he pressed on. He viewed himself as expendable for the gospel. Do you see verse 24? I do not account my life of any value. Here is one who is sold out to God. The gospel, the gospel. If only I can testify to the gospel. This is the whole course of his life. This is a task specially given to him by the resurrected Lord. He views his life as a race course, and he has no regrets. Pastor Tom, you've spent much of your ministry right here in Seneca. God has used you to build this church from just a handful of people. By the Spirit, you gathered in the elect of God meeting in various places in town, and then the Coney Christian Academy across the street here until our church here was built. And with all of this moving and building, you gave us yourself. You enjoy. We thank you, dear brother, for your faithfulness. You are willing to be spent for us. And then if you look at verses 25 to 27, Paul talks of a blameless ministry. In verse 25, he says, Now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Folks, who among us can say such a thing? Paul doesn't say he's innocent of the blood of this one or that one. No, he says he's innocent of the blood of all. How many times have we wished that we'd had the courage to speak the gospel when opportunity afforded us and failed to do so? Not so, Paul. Neither in numbers nor in substance did he neglect to declare the whole counsel of God and word. How blessed we are, folks, to have had a pastor who sought to follow Paul's example the whole time 
who walked and taught us here at Cross State. I'm amazed at how easily Tom can turn the conversation with strangers to ultimate issues of life, death, and the gospel. If anyone perishes because of ignorance of the gospel, it certainly will not be because it was not heard here and enjoined in this church. The scene now changes, all right? Paul now turns to address the elders specifically. Give them a charge. The focus changes. He now begins to charge these elders with heavy responsibilities. And this leads us, similarly, to address the responsibilities the elders have here at Crossgate. The first thing Paul says, you have the care of the flock, verse 28. Pay attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Paul's concern was protection and care of the Ephesian believers. So likewise should be the prime concern of the elders of Crossgate, the care and protection of believers here. This is a solemn task. That is to care as shepherds. But this can't be done without paying attention to themselves first. So Paul says, pay attention, pay careful attention to yourselves. The first line of satanic attack, guess where it's going to be? It's going to be with the elders, the leaders. The shepherds themselves must first be guarded, and then the flock. And folks, people are watching. You elders are influential beyond your awareness. But then, Paul says, pay attention to all the flock. Not just some of the flock, but all the flock. Not just the prestigious, not just the wealthy, not just the likable or the advantaged, but to all, no part should be neglected. Well, he obtained this congregation with the blood of his own son. Note that language. He obtained the Ephesian believers through the blood of God's own son. Look at the value God has placed upon the flock. He obtained it willingly by sacrificing his own son. What value? value he has placed on us and at so great a cost. The very life blood of his own beloved son. Look at how priceless the church is in God's sight. What a blot and stain would be upon the leaders if they failed in their, their duty. It's good for every leader to reflect on this, I think, with care. And guess who made you a leader. Paul says the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. This is a high calling. No one less than the Holy Spirit has placed the elders in positions of overseer. Though Paul had chosen and trained most of these folks, he openly attests that it was the Holy Spirit who was the real force that worked in them. It was the Spirit who appointed them. And what are they to do? They are to care for the flock, to feed the flock. Literally, it means to tend as a shepherd, to tend as a shepherd. Our Lord said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Paul's use of this image means that uh, he's asking the leaders of the church to imitate Jesus. They're to take care of the sheep and not to let them wander away. They are to watch out for their well-being, defend them from enemies. They are to do this because the flock is not theirs. The flock belongs to God. It was purchased at great cost. 
us, they are to guide, direct, protect, feed, and help the flock to grow to its full potential. The second thing that these elders are to do is to be alert to false teachers. See verses 29 to 31. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Fierce wolves is the language Paul uses here. The future is not promising from Paul's perspective. He sees a coming attack on the flock at Ephesus here by false teachers. It's an attack from outside the church and an attack from within the church. From outside will come the false teachers as they, as they would savage the congregation like uh, wolves with destructive teaching. From inside, some of their members will arise and will divert and distort, distort the truth to acquire followers and lead them to their doom. Elders must be on their guard with the unceasing vigilance. That eventually this took place in Ephesus and throughout the province of Asia can be seen in the pastoral letters of Paul and in the book of Revelation. You'll find that false teaching did indeed begin to influence these churches. In any case, Paul says, watch, be alert, remembering. See verse 31, admonishing. Note the constancy of the warnings, unceasing tears, the individuality of the warnings, each one, the intensity, the constancy. It's all there, folks. This is a demanding standard for pastors and elders to follow. Shepherds must never let down their guard. Sin, laziness, deception, distraction, disaster, both among themselves and the flock, got to be constantly warned against. And then, verse 32, be rooted in God and his word. And now I command you, commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul's personal guidance is coming to an end. His pastoral direction and wise admon admonition will no longer be theirs. So he commits these believers to God and to God's word. The word in the text here is the gospel, which proclaimed God's grace in redeeming them and his grace in sanctifying them. By embracing it and obeying it, this will build them up in the faith and love with fellow Christians. The word that's used here is the word of grace, the gracious word. Paul and the other apostles were destined to leave behind a sacred deposit, a word of grace, a gracious word. What did they leave behind? The scriptures. The scriptures of the New Testament as an addition to the Old Testament. True apostolic succession, folks, is not, as our Roman Catholic friends would say, in government. It's not succession in government. It's succession in doctrine and teaching. Succession, apostolic succession in doctrine and teaching. This word has the peculiar characteristic that it will build you up. Watch out, it'll build you up. Uh, it'll build you up in sanctifying grace. It also grants an inheritance with one's fellow holy ones, saints. In the light of this, how can we fail to immerse ourselves in the apostolic word? It takes the place of the, ap of the apostles themselves and a leading apostle commits us to it. Finally, folks, follow the example of a selfless motive, verses 33 to 35. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities 
and to those who are with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard and in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, more blessed to give than to receive. Paul returns to remarks similar to those made earlier in verses 18 to 30. Um, he gives three more marks of his ministry to them. Freedom from greed and covetousness, that's verse 33. Diligence in providing for his own needs and not being dependent on others, that's verse 34. And then verse 35, a selflessness, a generosity in ministry. Freedom from greed and covetousness. This was the content um, of Paul's concern. He was content and self-restrained. He coveted nothing that was not his. He was not in the gospel business to become wealthy. Diligent, he tried to provide, at least initially, with his churches with, to, by working with his own hands. He could have asked for support, but he chose not to. And uh, Tom, I know that you sold vacuum cleaners, I think, for a portion of your ministry as you've tried to get a church together and up and running. Uh, you may have done that here in, in Seneca, I don't know. But uh, uh, you were in good company with the Apostle Paul. He worked with his hands in order to get a church started. Um, all right, and then there's selflessness. Paul, in doing this, he gave an example for us to follow. They should, people should support themselves, others in need, and the sick especially. He told the Thessalonians something similar. He said, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we don't have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate, he said. He regularly admonishes Christians to work and support the weak. The weak are probably the sick. But it probably can be extended to include the spiritually, the emotionally, and the financially hurting. Paul urges the unwritten saying of the Lord Jesus that it's more blessed to give than to receive. We come to the farewell. And Paul finishes with a prayer of love, verses 36 to 38. Take a look at that, would you? When he said these things, verse 36, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Paul commits the Ephesian leaders to God's care. This prayer must have included petitions like, keep them by the power of your Holy Spirit and by the Scripture. Keep them from the evil one. Grant that the church may be strong, that it may be filled with people who know your word and who practice it. May they grow in grace, becoming strong in the knowledge of who you are, and may this knowledge lead to a walk of obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is also my prayer for Crossgate Church. May Crossgate flourish under God's grace and the ministry of Pastor David and the elders alike. Verses 37 and 38 give us a bittersweet departure. There was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all because of the word he had spoken, and that they would see his face not again. They accompanied him to the ship. All right, affection dominates the whole scene here. Deep as the heart itself. They all wept 
They embraced and they kissed Paul. They sorrowed most that they would never see him again. They, had a, they accompanied Paul to the ship for a bittersweet departure. They probably stood, probably wept and prayed till the mast of the ship disappeared over the horizon. Tom, we will not be watching the mast of your ship disappearing over the horizon. But maybe we will over the mountains. We will sorely miss you and joy. Our love, our prayers, our thankfulness go out to you and joy for a, a life of ministry which has blessed us all here at Crossgate. Thank you, dear brother and sister. David, the ball is now in your court. You and the elders, may you be heartened and sobered by the task lying ahead. May the God of the universe attend your ministry with great blessing and success. May God add his blessing to his word. Do you please stand as we close and we sing and praise the Lord who we pray will continue to work through us. How great thou art.
not sure this was a good idea for me to do the benediction. Uh, let me just say uh, how humbled we are and blessed uh, by what y'all have done this weekend. Oh, and Don, thank you. Uh, you've been such a blessing to me over the years. And you and Barbara, thank you. As you leave, now may the God of peace who brought up from the grave the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight, uh, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever.